God, let's get it. So, I want to thank you guys again, because you guys can be anywhere else. This is Saturday night at 6.30, Sabbath. I'm super grateful that you're here. And you know what? I know one thing. I, I, Father God, I thank you. I'm going to pray before we get going, and then I'm going to read the uh, Ten Commandments. I told you guys every time before I preach, we're going to do this. We are honoring God in the spiritual realm with the covenant of the Ten Commandments. And I tried to jump ahead, but I'm thankful for God for quickening that. If you want to go to Exodus... Uh, chapter 20, verse 3. I didn't put it in my notes, that's why I forgot. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get into that real quick and we're gonna honor God. So <clears throat> you guys there? You got a Bible? Mm-hmm. Good? Okay. Um does your daughter want one? Does the next one want back here? You like one? Copy that. <laughs> All good. All right, here we go. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers of the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. There's that, what I was telling you about, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, Verse 6. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. for For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his, <clears throat> excuse me, or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor. Now, that, that's, that's it right there. So I'm going to pray real quick. Let's start us out. Father, we love you so much. Father, we ask that you bring holy fire. Bring it down among every person that is in this church tonight, Father. We thank you. We praise you, Father. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I bind up the spirit of doubt and unbelief. I bind up the lying spirit. I bind up the spirit of distraction. I bind up the spirit of chaos. I bind up every foul and unclean spirit trying to run amok in here. It causes any differences of what the word says. Father, we praise you, King. We give you glory in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Woo! All right. I'm fired up, man. Fired up. I'm telling you. This stuff is so good. I get so excited. I want y'all to know what happened. So I got ready to preach this sermon. Um, I'd already went over it. And I'd already know because last week, oh, okay, thank you, God, for telling me that. Watch this, man. I got to tell you guys something. Because I'm just like you, just because I'm, I'm the pastor doesn't mean that I go through, that I don't go some of the things that you go through. And Katie and I have been busier than a one-legged man in a kickboxing contest. I'm here to tell you, every day of the week, we, I mean, we're just boom, 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 staying busy, working with our business, and then church, and then we've just been super busy. And Wednesday, we had, we do core study on Monday nights with, with our workers here. We do Bible study on Wednesdays, and then we're here on Saturdays. And then we did deliverances last week, and so Thursday came, and I'm like, Finally get home from work. It was late. I went to the gym, got back, and man, I'm trying to tell you, it was like already 8, 30, 9 o'clock. I'm like, all right, God, we got a day and a half to figure out what I'm going to preach, and I got to get in this, man, and I'm here to tell you. 
You guys know I pop off scripture and stuff, so I know the word pretty good. I've been been through it a bunch of times, and I'm just, man, through my knowledge. Listen, through my knowledge, I'm back here by Elijah, man. I'm in 2 Kings. I'm trying to flip through it. Woo! But I'm like, oh, yeah, we're going to do Elijah. No, we ain't going to do Elijah. Then I kick over here, man. I'm into Moses. I'm like, all right, we're going to do Moses, man. Can we talk about idolatry? We're going to do Moses. No, we ain't going to do, we ain't gonna do uh, Moses. Dang, Thursday night's done. Friday night comes. I'm like... Woo, this is not good. I need a sermon, God. What are we going to do, God? I can't mess up. We just starting out. <laughs> Come on. God said, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? I said, I'm over here on my knees <laughs> praying. I'm trying to get down with you. <laughs> this is what he said. You're trying to get in there and preach off your knowledge of what you know. He said, and that'll go fine. There ain't going to be no substance in it. He said, I can do more with you in five or ten minutes than getting in there and just really trying to get to know me. Have a walk with me and understand me, learn me, talk to me, speak to me. That right there, I can do more with that because the gospel says we open our mouth and he, his words can come out of our mouth. And Holy Spirit, I just say that, ask that it be your words that come out of my mouth today, not mine. And that just resonated with me so much. And I was stressed. I'm not going to lie to you, man, because a lot of people were coming. People, there was people coming from her son was coming out of town. And, man, there were just a couple of people, Terry, coming out of town. And I was like, whoo, man, I mean, just, I ain't going to lie, there's a little bit of pressure. I'm like, that's all right, I got big shoulders. No, man, listen, I was sweating it. Come Friday, I was sweating it. And I get in there, and I'm like, I'm just going to get back to where I was because I'm right I, right now I'm teaching in another study. I'm teaching Colossians. I'm teaching Mark, and I'm in Corinthians. So I'm bouncing back and forth. I was like, Psh, let's just go, God. My bad. I, I was just, do you understand what I'm saying? And it's not just for me. Don't just get into the Word just to do, to get this top layer of the Bible. You got to dig in it. You can't get in and give God that 40% of us. And expect to be walking with 100%. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't do that, man. You, I mean, it, it, it'll work for maybe just a little bit. But it's like what we're going to talk about. What we talked about Wednesday night. About building on rocky ground. You know what I'm saying? It gets choked out. The birds of the air will come. <laughs> suck it right out. Before you get out to the, to the car, it'll be so shallow that the birds of the air, which is the demons, we went over that, will suck it right out of us, man. And so I encourage you when you get into the word. It's not how many hours or whatever you do when you get in the Word. It's about that relationship time. You know, think about it if you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife. It's what you put in it is what you're going to get out of it. You can labor. You can do all this other stuff. But if you're not really trying to get down with God do what and get to know Him, you're going to be like me, stressing, hustling, running, trying to catch up. Trying to get a word from God, and it's gonna it's gonna be shallow. We don't drink. I'm not I'm not here to preach to give you guys the bottle to suck on it. And we ain't gonna do that, man. We're here to get the real stuff. We're get the meat and potatoes and understand what he's talking about in this word, and it's really important. So I just want to share that with you. Um, you know me, and then, you know when I get going, man, God will pull the brakes on me, and I'll swear left, man, in a hurry. Okay, God, I got you. But um, just wanted to share that with you. So we're in Mark 5, um, and man, this is so good. I got excited. Like I said, I, was, I, I thought I was done. I had some relief, and I was like, woo, I already knew on Wednesday. I'm like, we come up out of here Wednesday night. God's like, we're going to do 5 and 6 come, come Saturday night. I'm like, praise God, man. I mean, because this is good stuff. Um, and like I said, Mark Mark, like I was telling you guys, his name is John Mark. It's not Mark. This is the first gospel. And he starts out at Mark 1. He starts out with Jesus' ministry. It's not like in the book of Luke or book of John when it's telling you from the beginning as he's going through what he does there. He gets baptized right at the beginning. And John the, Bapt John the Baptist is the one that baptized him. The Bible said John the Baptist baptized with water. Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit fire. So when he got baptized, open the, the skies open. Down comes the Holy Spirit. Jesus gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's when his ministry starts. 
This is why we're. This is why I feel like God wanted me to start out in this book of Mark, take off running, and fill you guys with the word, fill you guys with the great commission, fill you guys with your with your gifts. You bring your gifts up, and not stifle them down, so you can operate in them in the full fruition of who He says you are, the power and authority that He's given to you, because it's so important. How are we to be separated from the world if we're not operating in our gifts? And why would he give us the Holy Spirit if we weren't operating in, a, in the gifts? We gave us that, the Holy Spirit, for a reason. Jesus was manifested to destroy the kingdom of darkness. And if we are to be imitators of Jesus, then we are here to what? Destroy the kingdom of darkness, right? Right? Nobody else was doing it before Jesus showed up. Nobody. You can't show me anywhere in the Old Testament where anybody cast out demons. You can't. Jesus was brought here to whoop up on the enemy. The enemy was having a heyday with God's people. And God loves us so much that he said, okay, we're going to get down with this, man. We can show you. And Jesus gives us a blueprint of how we are to walk here on earth. Straight up blueprint. And he didn't just do it in one book. He gives you four of them. You can take your pick, but it's all the same story, just from a different angle. Just from a different apostle or disciple's angle of how it's going. And so I get in, and I read this, and I'm like, woo, all right, we good, we good. And so this morning, I'm chilling, uh, just getting down with God a little bit. God told me this. He said, I want you to get back in the Bible and... Uh, Go over what you're going to preach tonight. Yes, sir. And I was going to freestyle this. Because, I mean, I, did, I know it well enough that I was going to freestyle it and just go through it. And he said, I want you to get a notebook out. Woo! Notebook. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I knew this was going to be good. I knew this was going to be fire. So I said, okay. And I get to writing. I get to reading what he's got for me here. And he breaks down so much for me. And I'm excited to share it with you. And, and I hope it just shines a light on what's really going on in this world. And again, like I said, the first, first Saturday that we preached, that I preached here, we went over the gifts of the Spirit. Last week, we went over the healings. And I told you the reasons why more times than not that we are not seeing healings is because we're not binding up demons before we pray for the healings. It is way better, listen to me, it's way better to take away the, the, that situation of the blocking and pray for the healing, and it come, let me back up. It's a whole lot better to bind up demons and demons not be there and pray for the healing to come than pray and have demons and the healing don't come. Come on, right? So, I mean, we need to handle this the way that God is handling it. I mean, the way Jesus is handling it here on earth. There was 24, 25 times, I forget, I, I lost count, and I please forgive me, but there was 24, 25 times Jesus healed in the Bible. Seven out of them times, he, it shows him casting out demons. And we're going to go over a bunch of these right here. So if you go, open up your book, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, and we're going to get after it. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him at the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore. Stop right there. Why couldn't they bind him? Guys, you guys know that, that, I, that our team does deliverance, and we wrestle against the principalities, the demons, the spiritual wickedness. And they, they, are, they are not to be played with. If you do not understand what you're doing, don't be fooling around with that stuff. You're messing with people's lives and you're messing with demons. I can go back to the sons of Sceva in the book of Acts when the Jewish priests were trying to cast out demons. They tried to cast out the demons. The demons were like, <laughs> we know who Jesus is. We know who Paul is, but who are you? Who? They whooped whoop their hind ends, man, to leave them, take them outside, their butt naked, tore up from the floor up in the, in the alleyway, right? So, it's showing right here that no, nobody can bind him up no more, not even with a chain. Verse 4, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. 
night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. You guys ever heard about anybody that has that is cutting themselves? They are cutters. Right here is a prime example. See, I get a lot of people, and it's, it it sucks the way that the way that the people with the religious spirit or have that spirit of fear that think we are just we're like, oh, it's demon this and demon that. No, we don't think everything is a demon. We don't. But there's an awful lot of example here in the Bible of what's going on. This guy right here in the tombs is cutting himself. Why? Because the demons are telling him, cut yourself, cut yourself, cut yourself. They want that blood, okay? Now watch this. And it's the same thing that goes on right now, believe me, because I deal with this, is when they cut themselves, they get temporary relief. They get temporary relief because they cut themselves and the blood comes out. The demons feed off that, right? And when they feed off that, it gives them that temporary fix. And that's all the demons are. That's what happens in this new age. That's what's going on with this witchcraft. All this hot garbage that's going on is only a temporary fix. And what does it do? It sets you up for the pain and everything that he's going through right here. And it's true to today, is it not? Everybody that is a cutter is dealing with this in some kind of way. And I just wanted to, God, listen, God broke this down to me, and I just thought, you know, I skimmed over that. Remember what I told you earlier? Don't skim across it. There's so much more in the Bible if you'll dig, right? So, verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, Whatever you do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God. Man, that's telling me something right there. You know, you got people out here that are saying he's just a prophet. He's just, he's just somebody that was walking the earth that was doing good. But even the demons understand who he is. And that's proof right there. Come on. So these naysayers and stuff that are calling him not, not the son of the most high king, the demons know who he is. Come on. And they, they know what time it is. They know one day they're going to get down and they're going to bow before him. You know? And so are we. So we need to recognize who he is. Watch this. So he says, I adjure you by God. Verse, uh, we're right above verse 8. I adjure you by God. Do not torment me. For he was saying to him. All right. Verse 8. It says, for he was saying to him. We are in Mark chapter 5 and verse 8. And good to see you. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Um, for he was saying to him. That right there is an in, uh, imperfect tense. And what that means is that he was telling that demon more than one time to come out. I've heard people say that you ain't gonna, if Jesus didn't have to tell the demons to come out more than one time, well, that's a lie from the pits of hell because right there's a perfect example. The demon disobeyed. That's why Jesus had to tell him more. That's what it means right there. For he was saying to them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Listen, there's another one. I'm trying to equip you guys for the day that you go and you have to handle this. There's not, it's not if. You're, God has given you this information to prepare you for the situation when you come upon it, when you're going to do a deliverance, when you're going to cast out demons. Because let me tell you something. The great commission means, the word commission is, the word commission means instructed, commanded. If you're in that situation and you don't, do you know that's disobeying God? Disobeying God? That is a sin. Bottom line right there. We don't negotiate, according to Katie, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Demons are terrorists. We don't negotiate with them. But if we got a demon over here that is, well, I, I, demons are like dogs. If I got a dog over here named Bo and I got a dog over here named Dixie and I tell Bo, Dixie, get outside. He ain't going to listen to me. Why? His name ain't Dixie. Come on. So if you're dealing with the spirit of Leviathan, and you're calling the spirit of divination, that demon's not going nowhere. And I'm speaking from experience. All right, we're not going to harp on this too long, but I want to break this down to you so you understand what we're dealing with. They're giving prime example right here in the gospel. They're not saying it's all got their side of their mouth. They're not talking to hear their jaws rattle. They're giving you straight truth right here. Okay? So here we go. He said, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. 
And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Why did he say he didn't want them to go out of the country? Because the country that he was in is a heathen country. They're, the men there were easy accessible. You hear what I'm saying? They're operating in sin. They're operating in self-doubt. They're operating like Pharisees. They, they want to hear it, but they're not down with God. You know what I'm saying? They're not down with what he's doing. So please, don't make us go out in the country. Let us hang out right here. We can just go into somebody else. Watch what happens. Watch this. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. Why did he want them to go to the pigs? We are in a war. We are in a straight-up battle against this demonic realm. We're on a spiritual war, war right now. And because, listen to me, because what could Jesus have done? When we do a, when we do a deliverance, when we, we cast them out, we send them to the pit. We send them to the abyss. Why? Because that is their final destination. We take them out of circulation. But understand this. Watch this. This is how good God is to me. The pigs are created by God. So they wanted to get in. Since they, since they couldn't finish destroying the man in the tombs, they wanted to destroy the pigs that God created. That's how big time... He, that there's a war here. You understand what I'm saying? It's again, they, they want to destroy everything about God. They want to destroy everything about you. We have to be careful what we're doing. I'm trying to tell you. Stay focused on God. Jesus is enough. Don't, don't, give me, don't let me fool you anything else. He is enough. And if you see my posts on Facebook, I put up there, the, the cross took away the power of the sin, but it did take away the presence of the sin. And with the presence of the sin comes circumstances, right? And these circumstances cause sin. And we continue to do that habitually. I've told you time and time again, habitual sin will open up doors and let demons enter us. And we wonder why we do some of the things that we do that are controlling our mind and our will and our emotions. I'm just telling you, that's a prime example right there. So watch it. Here we go. Verse 13. So he gave them permission, and unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd numbering about 2,000. Let me hit you with this. Watch this. The word legion means 6,000. That is a Roman army troop. That is the strength. With its 6,000, that is the maximum strength of a Roman army. That's where the word legion comes in. So if there's 2,000, listen, watch this. If there's 2,000 pigs... That means there's, there's, there's three times that many of demons to go into them pigs. That's how many the, the demons were. Because if the legion is 6,000, you're dealing with 2,000. Do your math. It ain't no joke. They coming. They coming with everything they got. That's why I'm telling you, you cannot sweep under the rug the verse John 10.10 10, that says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's a fact. But we sweep it under the rug and go, eh, you know, well, I mean, yeah. You know, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. But he's out to steal your happiness. He's out to steal your joy. He's out to steal your relationships. He's out to kill you, take you plumb out. He's out to destroy your jobs. He's got a game tape on you. You understand what I'm saying? He's trying to get the advantage of you. He's trying to take you out of the game of your anointed calling. Because when you're anointed, when you're done, and when you're cooperating on this, listen, you're not, you're not looking out to see who you can witness to. You're not out preaching the gospel. You're trying to fix yourself, and you're buried, right? I'm just telling you, man, less of us means better for him. We don't want to make it better for him. We want to win souls. Go ye into the world to preach the gospel. But if, but if we're ate up with sin, we're ate up in demon. I'm trying to tell you, we're going to go up to there. We'll go up there and say, oh, man, I, yeah, I need to pray for you. But, man, I was watching that porn last night. Come on. You know what I'm saying? So that sin will control your mind. So here we go. He said, number in about 2,000, rushed down to the steep bank, into the sea, and drowned the sea. Verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, 
sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Why were they afraid? Because this dude was normal again. It is common, listen to me, it is common for Christians to have demons, man. I'm not here to preach on demons, I'm not. This Bible is, though. It's telling us that right there. Before we were saved, we were in the world, we were of the world, and we were doing worldly things. The Bible says do not conform to the world. Why? Because it opens the door for this stuff to happen. And I've told y'all time and time again, when churches come and ask me to come and preach and do a deliverance, preach on deliverance or do a mass deliverance, whatever, you got you got haters out there. You just do. The demons that got in there and control their mind, they're like, well, we ain't got no demons. Well, let me ask you this. Who cast out your demons when you got saved? Because if you tell me God, I'm going to tell you to show me in the scripture where it says that, and I'll jump on board with you. I'll come in agreement with you. Happily. Because I believe the word with every inch of my heart. But if you can't show me, then I'm going to ask you, where do you think they went? Do you think just because Jesus died on the cross, they split and they're not here on earth no more? I'm going to tell you, show me that in the scripture too. Here we go. Verse 16. And those who had seen it described it to them what had happened to the demons possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to, to depart from their region. Remember back there they were saying, Beelzebub, this is Beelzebub casting out Beelzebub. Jesus is trying to explain to him, man, why would he do that, man? Beelzebub wouldn't be able to stand. You, man, don't, you don't, uh, the house will not stand. Why would Beelzebub cast out Beelzebub? But that's what they're thinking. They think he's evil. So verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with a demon begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how the Lord has done for you. And how he has mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. And he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And he seeing him, he fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well in life. And he went with them. What did he do? He asked him to lay hands. Why? Because people are already talking about it. I'm telling you what, you guys are separated from the world. That's why the Bible says, Lay hands upon the sick, and they will recover. They got faith in Jesus. But do we have that much faith? If somebody comes and says, look, man, my, my, my son or daughter's in the hospital. Do you have enough faith to say, man, I got you? Because John 14, 12, he said, we'll do greater things than what Jesus did. Do we believe that? Or do we just believe a little bit? Do we believe half the Bible, but the other half is kind of like, eh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that one, Bubba. You're on your own. Sorry about your luck. We all got to ride out of here someday. Well, that's a lie, man. You're being disobedient. Here we go. Verse 23. And implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with them. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. <laughs> and there was a woman. Watch this. Watch this. This is so good. Woo! And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians. Stop. Woo! Stop. I've told y'all, man, a doctor cannot diagnose a demon. Can't do it. Sorry about your luck. You could have all these problems, but a doctor can't fix you. Same thing in Luke 13, 10, when the woman was bent over with a spirit of infirmities. She kept going to the church, couldn't get it. Nothing could happen. And Jesus cast that demon out. Now, there was no demon cast out. But watch what happens here. Twelve years she spent. She's out of money. She's out with sin. But she hears about Jesus. And her faith has got her pushing through the crowd, just like in Mark 2. Remember when they couldn't get to Jesus, his friends, 
pushed through, pushed through, climbed up on that roof, took the roof off, and because of the guy's faith, his friend's faith, not the guy that was in the bed, but because of the guy's, the guy's friend's faith, they lowered him down. He said, because of their faith, you are healed. Watch what happens right here. Faith is everything, man. I'm trying to tell you. Faith will move mountains. Faith will slay giants. Faith will do miracles. But you cannot have doubt and unbelief. And I'm here to tell you, this woman who is busting through a crowd had enough faith to move men out of the way. You hear me? Move men out of the way. She just wanted to touch him. She just wanted to put hands on him. Watch this. She said, and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, it was no better, but rather grew worse. Why do you think she grew worse? I'm trying to tell you. Steal, kill, and destroy. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Garment, For he said, if I just touch his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flood, the flow of the blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed. This was a supernatural. This is a supernatural healing. How did she activate it? By her faith. Her faith activated the supernatural. Jesus didn't touch her. He didn't lay hands on her. Her faith caused the supernatural to, to go into full 100% throttle. Come on. I'm encouraging, I'm trying to encourage every single one of you. If you'll remove, that's why it says, the faith of a mustard seed will move this mountain. It will slay that giant. It will do these miracles. Why will, a, why will the faith of a mustard seed do it? Because it, it's only big enough just to hold faith. There's no room in there for doubt and unbelief. None. And it's that much faith that a slay Goliath and to move mountains. And her faith, she only had that much. And because of her faith touching that, she was healed. Instantly. Instantly. And she, he said, the blood dried up and she felt her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him. What? Power. Do we have the same power that Jesus had walking this earth? And greater, come on, man. We got the same Holy Spirit dwelling inside us that raised Jesus from the dead, that raised Lazarus from the dead. And he said, I felt power leave me. Come on, man. That's exciting. Here we go. And he said, I felt that power leave and gone out from it, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? What's up? Who grabbed me? Who did that? And his disciples said, <laughs> bro, you see the crowd pressing around you? And yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling. What do we come in? How do we live our salvation? Um, I don't even, I'm not even looking at my notes. I already know, but I think it, man. Ooh, I think it's Philippians 2.12. Don't caught me on it. I might be wrong, but I doubt it. Philippians 2.12, he says that we are to live out our safe salvation through fear and trembling. This young lady was living out her salvation through fear and trembling. She's on her last end. This is how we live our salvation. All this arguing and all this hot garbage that's going on in Facebook, trying to see who's better, who has more knowledge, who's right, who's wrong, tearing down. Although the Bible says, tear down, down my anointed. Do I lay hands on my anointed? Oh, but I know more than you. No, you're dumb. Now, you need to live your salvation out through fear and trembling. Don't worry about nobody else's. Come on. Here we go. And fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. You look through the Bible, all through the Bible, when Jesus talks to people. Not one time did he call anybody daughter or son. Come on. That's the only time that he says daughter. Why? Because of her faith. She wasn't wavered one way, left or right. He said, daughter, because of your faith, because of your faith. Come on, man. I'm trying to build you up, man. I'm trying to fill you with this. And Father, I ask that you just rain that fire down on them. Because your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. 
While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. <laughs> Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Watch this. Do not fear. Only believe. Mm -hmm. Only believe. Look here, guys. Let me tell you something. Heads up. If you have to see it to believe it, you're never going to see it. I'm sorry about your luck. You're not. Mm -hmm. Numerous times, I want to tell you it's 85 times in the gospel. I'm almost positive I'm right. Jesus says, only believe. The Bible says all things are possible for those who believe. We are to walk by faith, not by sight. And if you're walking by faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but not yet seen. And he said, only believe. Don't worry about this. Believe. You came to me. You believe that far. Don't let that and unbelief get in here. And I'm going to show you why. Watch this. He said, do not fear. And plus, he didn't bless you with a spirit of fear anyways, right? He said, according to 2 Timothy 1.7, he said, I did not bless you with a spirit of fear, but with power, love, and a sound mind. If you break that down in the Greek, the word power means Holy Spirit. Imagine that. The word means power means Holy Spirit. Who represented love in the Bible? Jesus, right? And a sound mind, he said, you got a Christ-like mind. So there you go. Why would you have fear? He said, no, I didn't bless you with no fear. I blessed you with the Holy Spirit. I blessed you with Jesus. And I blessed you with a sound mind, with a Christ-like mind. I've set you up for victory. Your, your whole life is set up from the get-up. Why operate in fear? Fear is the pinnacle point of the hierarchy of demons. I wonder why that is. Everything operates off of fear. Everything. Think about it. God said, I didn't bless you with it. Don't claim it. Don't walk in that hot trash. Because that's coming from the father of lies. Every time he opens his mouth, lies. And he wants you to hit you with fear because everything else can branch out off of that. Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one, watch this, and he allowed no one to follow him in except his boy, his right-hand man, Peter. What? His right-hand man, Peter, and the sons of thunder. Can you imagine being called the sons of thunder? What? Jesus is like, what up, sons of thunder? Hey, y'all come rock with me. What's up, cool? Hey, we about to go raise the dead. I'm in. I'm in. No doubt, no one believes. Why does he tell nobody else to come? I'm trying to tell you. Doubt and unbelief will block your miracles. It's impossible, according to Hebrews. It is impossible to please God without faith. That doubt and unbelief will put up a wall. Yeah. So Peter, his right-hand man, the slugger, the one that cuts off ears for my boy, he said, come rock, let's go, boy. You, sons of thunder, let's go, watch this. He said, do not fear, only believe, and he allowed no one to follow him. He said, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Verse 38, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Watch this. And they laughed at him. What did Jesus do? <whistles> out! Everybody out! You got to understand, man. There's more times than just when Jesus flipped the tables in the temple and made that whip and chased him down and down and busted the crack on the behind. You hear me? There's more times than Jesus showing to get angry. And he didn't appreciate that doubt and unbelief. Get out. Get out. There's another story what Peter did to Dorcas in the book of Acts, but I'm going to stay focused right here. But I'm trying to tell you, what Jesus does, he'll do for you. What Jesus does for me, he's going to do for Wendy. What Jesus does for me, he's going to do for Terry. And so on. You understand what I'm saying? So, if you got doubt and unbelief, tell him to get out. You got to go, man. This is just for me and my boys. You either believe it or you don't. Your call, man. You want to see the miracle? These signs will follow those who believe. Here we go. 
He said, man, she's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them, to give her something to eat. We're on chapter 6. We we're we're just got this last chapter. We'll get out of here, guys. Chapter 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is that not his, uh, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Jose and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to him, a prophet, watch this guys, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could not do mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Their unbelief really kept a lot out. And these people here were walking by sight, right? Mm -hmm. They're not walking by faith. Though they heard about this dude, the dude speaking with wisdom, he's speaking with power, but he's in his hometown. All right? There's going to be a lot of people that come against you. I promise you. Especially, listen to me. It's not if you guys come up to a situation where you're going to have to operate in your gifts, operate with the Holy Spirit in you, to pray for healing, to pray for whatever you're doing, whatever your gifts are. It's not if, it's when. You're not here on accident, I promise you. And just like God sets up divine appointments for us, the enemy is setting people up to come against us. He knows who you are. He knows your anointing. He knows what's going to go on. I told you all this. I'm going to tell this story again. Watch this. You talk to somebody. You see him. Oh, oh man. Like, what's wrong, bro? Oh, my back, man. My back. Bro, let me pray for you, man. You're all right, man. I've had five people pray for me. I'm good. It just ain't gonna happen. Don't you know that is a demon manifesting out of them? Mm -hmm. That is a demon manifesting out of them saying, he's, he's sitting there talking in a smooth operation way. He's speaking, not like he's convulsion, he's not screaming, he's not yelling. The demons come in everything that we love, every sin that we love, every way that we hear, and he just softly, no, man, we're all good. We've already had five people. You want to know why? You want to know why those other five people uh, didn't see the healing? Because of lack of knowledge. Jesus said, my people will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Right here, he's casting out demons. He's casting out demons when they get saved, get healed. Nobody bound up the demons. That demon knew what was going to happen. If he got bound up, he had to go. Then the heathen was coming. They are out to steal, kill, and destroy you, right? Yeah. One more situation I'm going to tell you. This is another one where a demon will manifest. Oh, you know, I mean, I've had somebody pray, and it's just, it's not God's timing. That negates the word. Who negates the word? The enemy, right? How did the enemy fight Jesus in the wilderness? He fought him with, he tweaked the word. He would hit him with the word, but he tweaked it just a little bit. And that's what he was saying. Oh, but it, it's just not God's timing. The timing was when Jesus died on the cross and he took those beatings. When he hung on that cross, it said, by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53. Right there. So what are you believing? Are you believing half the Bible? Or are you believing the demon that said, uh, it's not his timing? Push through. That's okay. Just let me pray one time. Let me get. Let me try one. Let me just try something real quick. Bind that spirit of infirmity. 
Bind the spirit of sickness. Man to come out in Jesus' name. Watch that healing come. I'm just telling you, man. I'm trying to give you information. I'm trying to tell you how the enemy's going to work against you. There's a divine appointment set up for you. God has set you up. If you are praying for this for divine appointments, believe that they're going to come. It's not if, it's when. Are you prepared when they come? I'm trying to give you arsenal weapons. To fight against this. I'm trying to give you an example. I'm trying to give you straight up Bible. I'm not giving you Mark's opinion. I'm telling you what the Bible says right here. But yet we got people in the other churches that say, I don't know, man. I can't really. What do you mean you can't? Well, I'm afraid if they don't get healed, it's going to mess with their faith and they won't come back. So you're telling me their sickness or, their, or whatever's going on is bigger than our God? I'm just saying, man, that doubt and unbelief is a blocker. The faith of a mustard seed will do that, man. We'll move mountains. We'll slay giants. We'll cause miracles. Whose team are you on? Who are you riding with? You riding with a king? You got the enemy running shotgun listening to him chirping your ear. I'm just saying, man, you're either going to walk in and believe it or you might as well pack your bags and just take the punch of bags in your face. I'm just saying, here we go. A prophet is not without honor. We're on verse 4 again. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could not do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages and teachings. Verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. Boop. There's a reason why he sent them out two by two. Now I'm going to speak on deliverance just a little bit, a quick second. And I know you guys hear about it. You hear about me doing it. But Mark doesn't go in by himself. There's a reason why Jesus sent them out two by two. I take a partner with me always. Always. Greater is he that is in you, for sure. There's a reason why Jesus did that. So don't go in as a rookie. Don't go in doing all this stuff, man, without knowledge. Go in with somebody, number one, that knows what they're doing. Go in with somebody that's seasoned. Take notes. Get their notes. Write it down. Get seasoned. Listen to what they're doing. Understand the legalities. Understand everything that you're going up against. Now, he sent them out two by two, and I'm trying to tell you, he has set an example right here. We are called God, the saints. We are called Jesus' disciples. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High King. We have the same powers that Jesus did, and so did the disciples. Listen here, and here's for those who say that we don't have the powers and the gifts anymore. These cessationists, the gifts didn't start with the disciples, so they didn't end with the disciples. They started with Jesus. Jesus is still rocking. He sent us that help, so we can continue this out. So if that ain't enough to fill you up, to go do what you're called to do, then it is what it is. Come on. Here we go. Verse 7 again. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except his staff. No bread, no bag, no money in his belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. A tunic is their dress or whatever is what they pull up. It looks like a man dress, but that's what they wore back there. Whoop. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you that. Uh, verse 10. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if there, whoo, and if any place will not receive you, and they not listen to you, when you leave, hey, Shake the dust off, off your feet as a testimony against him. Keep it moving. If somebody's coming against you and they don't, they're like, you're full of it, blah, 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 keep it moving. They're, what they think about you is none of your business. And I'm preaching to myself right now. What people think about you, what you're doing, what you're believing is none of your business. It's only between you and your father. Are you going to get shook? Are you going to get left to the left or the right? Are you going to be like what, Paul, what James said? Don't be double-minded, man. Stay focused. Stay centered. Stay plowing. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 27, it says, don't swerve left. Don't swerve right. Stay focused. Don't let your foot get caught by no evil. 
but stay right down the middle. Plow. Keep plowing. It doesn't matter what these missiles are coming. The Bible says a weapon may form against you, and it may look like it's big and huge coming at you. It'll never prosper. When God is for you, no matter who's against you, who cares? Dust your boots off. Keep it moving. Here we go. Verse 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. <laughs> that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. And others said, he's a prophet. Like I said, remember what I told you? A lot of people say, he's just a prophet, just a man walking this earth. He's not the son of man he had in Canaan. That's what a lot of Jews believe. That they're still waiting on the, the, the son of God to come. Right? So that's what they're saying. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had been had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, Her, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your, your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and holy, a holy man and kept him safe. What? What did he do? He feared John. Why? Why do you think he feared John? Because of that Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is so powerful in my man. John the Baptist had no doubt. And he called people out in a hurry. Are we built like that? Are we built like John the Baptist? Because I guarantee you, John didn't have John the Baptist had no fear. That was Jesus' boy. Come on. And I'm trying to tell you, this is a prime example, man. I'm trying to, I'm trying to shovel it to you, man, of how we're supposed to be rocking. Come on. All right. And he said, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and a holy man and kept him safe. When he heard he heard he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came from Herod on his birthday. He gave a banquet for his nobles. Nobles back in the day were government high ups. And, you know, Herod's the king, so he's going to pull the high ups in the, in the government, the military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. These leading men were the elite. These are the ones that had all the money. These were the quote unquote, the important people, right? And he's got them at their party. What do people, what do people do? What do you think most do? What do we see celebrities do most of the time when they're partying, when they have a birthday party? They're drinking, getting down when they get down, right? Yeah. Now you got you got Herodias now. That's his wife, and his daughter. Her daughter is about to go dance for these people. And I'll just put it right here. You guys know what? Is it still Lido's that on the beach? That's how she's dancing. Mm -hmm. Understand this. And they've been drinking. This girl's out here butt naked dancing in front of these guys, all right? Now watch, you got to do study. I told you, you can't skim the top of the Bible. You need to dig in and figure out what's going on here. Watch this. He said, on his birthday, he brought the nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughters came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Hoo-hoo! Drunk. You got to believe you drunk. Woo! Give me a shot. Give me another one. Ask me for whatever you wish, <laughs> and I'll give it to you. <laughs> he drunk. He ain't, ain't going to ask for much, man. I mean, shoot, watch this. He said, shoot. And he loved, bowed to her. Whatever you ask me, shoot, man, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. This dude's about lost his mind. He's about three sheets in the wind. you got to imagine. Watch what happens. This is how the enemy, this is how the enemy works. He works when we are at our weakest point in life. And we become weak at that moment when we're drinking. We're drinking them spirits in there. We're doing stuff. Wine is a mockery. Strong drink is a brawler. This is the stuff that distorts our mind, that dilutes our mind. Come on, watch this. He said, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately in haste to the king and asked him, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. 
Have we ever did that, man? Have we ever spoke without thinking it all the way through? Yeah, man, I'll do that for you. I got you. All right, give me the head of John the Baptist. Oh, crap. Oh, snap. Oh, what have I done? Mm. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, the elite, the government men, the military, he had to flex, right? Oh, shoo-hoo. Here we go. He said, because of his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executor with orders to bring John's head. He went in and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus in to verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot. All the towns got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Because they were, they were sheep without a shepherd. Woo! Come on, man. Ezekiel 34, huh? Come on. And he began to teach them many things. And when it, when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. And the hour is now late. Verse 36. Send them away to go into surrounding countrysides and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five loaves of bread and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And taking the five, watch this, guys, because I'm going to hit on this. Watch this. He said, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. And he asked God to do what he's famous for, multiply that food. This takes me back to the verse of John 14, 12. It says, verily, verily, I say unto you, those who believe in me will do the things that I do and greater things greater things you'll do because I go to my father. My man right here manifested food. It's going to say that he fed 5,000. But that was the men. That didn't count the wives and the kids that were rocking with him too. Come on. But just say that just one kid and one wife. That's 15,000 people he's feeding with five loaves and two fish. Talk about some faith. Talk about believing. He set an example, man. We can't be wavering. We have to have that kind of faith. A non-shaking faith. He looks up to the heavens and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. And there were 12 baskets left? You believe that or what, man? Yeah. Come on. You're right. right. I believe that. You got to. It's in the word that it's true. This word is true. It never comes back void. Mm-hmm. Test it, man. I promise you I have. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when he even came to the boat, was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch, the fourth watch is from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Okay? And... Because of that, 
He said, hold on, let me see. But about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. No, man, I, why did I say that? Hold on, that's not right. Because 12 to 3 is 1, 3 to 6 is 2, 6 to 9 is 3, 9 to 12 is 4. Please forgive me, I said that wrong. I don't know, I think I even have that in there too. I think I wrote it wrong. I looked it up. It says the fourth watch. Watch this. But in my notes, watch this. The fourth watch is the time between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's what my notes say, but I think they're wrong. That's crazy. But anyways, he said on the fourth watch, he came to them walking on the sea. He wanted them to see them. He walked by on the sea on purpose. Because that remember, remember before, beforehand, he was in the stern and there was waves coming on and they're like, Master Rabbi, what are you doing, dude? He said, you a little faith. Peace be still, right? So he calmed these waves. Now he's out on top of these waves. He's stomping and trampling these waves. Not only did he want them to see that, but there's something else. If you dig in this a little bit deeper, watch this. Guess what stays in, in underneath the sea? What? Demons. Leviathan is a water serpent. Straight up says it. Demons are underground. They're in the water. Jesus rises above and he's walking on water to show that he's the main deity. He is the one above all of these. And he's on top of them. And he's flexing for them boys right then. I have power over all of them. Didn't he just give them the power to go out and cast out unclean spirits? Didn't he just say that in these verses a little bit earlier? Jesus is doing a flex right there for these guys. And if you can wrap your mind around this and really grab a hold of it, that's who you are. That's who you are walking this earth. But it's the doubt and unbelief that's in our heart that says, no, it ain't. That was Jesus. My name don't even rhyme with Jesus. I'm telling you, man, how you walking. Jesus is flexing for a reason. Here we go. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. There's another time where God, where Jesus is really aggravated. When they called him, the Pharisees said that you're Beelzebub casting out Beelzebub. It's because they're hard and hard. That's why he got angry. Now he's seen his disciples. The first time they didn't have enough faith that he could calm the seas. Now they, they see him walking. There's no faith there. Now their hearts are hardened. Come on. There's a reason why we say this, man, because it's going to come up the next verse next week. <clears throat> when they had crossed over, they came to the land at, at woo, Genesaret and more to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they had heard he was. Why? Because of their faith. Come on. It is important who we hang out with, guys. It is so important who you're rocking with. If you're hanging out, listen to me. If you're hanging out with five lukewarm people, five people that say they're Christians, and you're hanging out with five of them, you're going to be the sixth one. Mm -hmm. But if you're hanging out with five that are on fire, come on. You see their faith working? You see how they operate? But no doubt and unbelief, you're going to become the sixth one on fire. Are you going to be the ones that take the roof off and lower your boy down there because of your faith? Because you're on fire and you know without a doubt Jesus is going to heal him? Or are you going to be like, well, um, hey, I'm praying for y'all. I'm out, but I'll holler at you. I'm praying. Believe that I'm praying. With your doubt and unbelief, tell them to get on down the road. God, the Bible says don't be hanging around with people that don't bear fruit. You judge a tree by its fruit. They may have fruit. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. There may be fruit. That fruit dead. Done. Shake it, it falls. Squashed. Down for us. 
When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and moored into the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized them and ran about the whole region and, be, and began to bring the sick people on the beds. Wherever there they heard he was and wherever he came in, villages, cities, or countrysides, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe on his garment. What? Even the fringe on his garment. And as many touched it, were made well. And that's it. So verse seven. It's so it's so amazing to watch God how He is operating in me and through me to fill you guys, and I want you to know how grateful that I am that you guys are here. And know this: God has got you here because of your heart. God doesn't judge us by the sin in our life. He doesn't judge us by the things that are going on. He's looking for frontline warriors, man. He's not looking for, for believers that are sitting in the stands rooting on the people that are on fire down there doing the works. Works won't get us to heaven. It won't. But your faith is dead without works. 100%. It's dead. Flat out. Show me your faith, and I'll show you my works. Come on. And my works will separate me from the people in the world. Who do your friends say you represent when you walk out this door? Who do your workers say that you represent? Jesus. Jesus. Do they say you represent Jesus? Or are they not sure? Because Jesus said, you recognize me among, among your friends? I recognize you among my father. But if you deny me among your friends, sorry about your luck. Get out my face, you son or daughter of iniquity. I never knew you. Sorry about your luck. Exit stage left. Take the slide down. You got a free ride, homie. See ya. And he ain't going to blink. You had a shot, man. I'm trying to tell you, represent Jesus. Represent him proudly. Represent him. Straighten out your crown. Pull your shoulder back. Speak with your chest, because I'm telling you right now, he knows your name. The mighty king that is above all kings knows your name. He knows who you are. You are dedicated to be here. And I'm here to exhortate you, to build you up, to fill you up, to tell you who you are in Christ. You are royalty. You are anointed. You are precious. You are chosen. You are royalty priesthood according to the Bible. That's who you are. So you take that, put it in your pocket, stick it in your heart, put it in your brain, pray for God to instill that on your heart, that it never goes. And to bring remembrance when you come across your divine appointments that you guys are praying for diligently, just like you're praying for your kids. Because the Bible says to go ye into the world, preach the gospel to every creature here on earth, Baptized with water, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will step on serpents. They will drink poison, will not be harmed. They will speak in tongues. They will lay hands upon the sick. They will recover. They will cleanse the leper. They will raise the dead. We just showed Jesus doing it. Is your faith strong enough to do that? Not raise the dead. I'm just saying, man. Who are you riding with? That's who you need to ask yourself, who you ride with. I love you guys, man. Let me pray this out. Y'all ready? Father, we love you so much. Thank you for speaking through me, God. I just pray that everything that was going out here with the words were anointed, that it went and planted right where it was supposed to be. I pray for everybody out there on Facebook, God, that was watching this. I pray for everybody in here. God, I pray for divine appointments. And I pray for remembrance. Knowing that you look down on us and say, that's my son or daughter. Who am I well pleased? Go get them, man. I got you. Bless us as we go. I pray for everybody to have a nice, hard sleep. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you call us yours in your name. Amen. 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 You. God bless you.